Conclusion Underway toward a critique of subjective reason. Quoting J. V. Eichendorf, Zweierlicht, 1815. What goes under today, tired, rises tomorrow, newly born. Some things stay lost in night. Take care, stay alert and lively. Quoting Peter Rumkoff's Selbstportrait, 1979. Perhaps it is only this. My heart gradually attracts the buzzards. He who no longer sees any land on the left, for him the earth soon races, like a worn-out tyre toward the eternal rubbish dumps. doodle a doot now don't run straight away to mama with your devastations. Right at the beginning of the history of European philosophy, a laughter rose up that renounced its respect for serious thinking. Leishus tells us how the proto-philosopher Thales, the father of the Ionian philosophy of nature and the first in a series of men who personify Western Horatio, once left his house in Miletus, accompanied by an old servant, to devote himself to the study of the heavens. Along the way he fell into a ditch. The woman then called out the following words to the one who was crying out, You can't even see, Thales, what lies before your feet, and you fancy that you know what is in the heavens. This mockery inaugurates a second, largely invisible dimension of the history of philosophy that is inaccessible to historiography, namely the history of the sublation, Aufhebung, of philosophy. It is more a tradition of physiognomic, eloquent gestures than of texts. Nevertheless, it is a tradition just as densely and reliably woven as the, tr as the tradition in which the great doctrines were recorded, handed down and practiced. In this tendentially mute tradition, a number of fixed gestures appear that through the millennia recur with the archetypal force of perseverance and adaptability of primitive motifs. A sceptical shaking of the head. A malicious laugh. A return with a shrug of the shoulders to things that lie closer to hand. A realist astonishment at the helplessness of those who are the most intelligent. A stubborn insistence on the seriousness of life against the frivolous word garlands of abstraction. Here what gives philosophical thinking its greatness is exposed as an expression of weakness, as the inability to be small, and as the absence of spirit from the most obvious. In the present essay on the structure and dynamic of cynical phenomena, this history of the sublation of philosophy was given firmer contours. It was related how, in the cynicism of Diogenes as Sinope, the laughter about philosophy itself became philosophical. I wanted to show how, in the pantomimes and word plays of the philosopher from the tub, the gay science was born, which saw the earnestness of the false life recur in the false earnestness of philosophy. With this, the satirical resistance of conceptually informed existence against the presumptuous concept and against a teaching that has been blown up into a form of life begins. Socrates Menos embodies in our tradition an impulse giver who denounces idealistic alienation at the moment of its emergence. In this he went so far as to use his whole existence as a pantomimic argument against philosophical inversions. Not only did he react extremely sensitively and coarsely to the moral absurdities of higher civilization, he was also the first to recognize the danger embodied in Plato, that the school will subjugate life, that the artificial psycho psychosis of absolute knowledge wants to destroy the vital connection between perception, movement and understanding, and that, in the grandiose earnestness of idealistic discourse, 
nothing other than that earnestness returns with which life most lacking in spirit stifles itself with its cares, its will to power and its enemies with whom one cannot fool around. In Diogenes' anti-philosophical jokes, an ancient variant of existentialism takes on a form Heinrich Niehuis Prübsting has called, with a very happy phrase borrowed from Gagon, the cynical impulse. He means the sublation of philosophizing and mentally alert life oriented simultaneously towards nature and reason. From this source springs the critical existentialism of satirical consciousness that cuts through the space of respectably presented European philosophies as if it were a secret diagonal. An agile, worldly wise intelligence had always rivaled the stodgy discourses of serious theologists, metaphysicians, moralists and ideologues. Even the mightily eloquent dialectician Marx, who wanted to heal the world of its inversions, and the despairing ironist Kierkegaard, who burst open the false sovereignty of having understood everything with the principle of existence, they too stepped as latecomers into the age-old tradition of perpetual sublations of philosophy. After Marx, Kierkegaard and Nietzsche, only those efforts of thought who still deserve a universal hearing that promise to keep step with the ironic, practical and existential sublations of philosophy. For more than 100 years, critical philosophy has no longer possessed its enough self-certainty to let itself be caught sojourning any longer by its traditional serious naiveties. Therefore, since then, for its part, it has exerted itself in rivalry with those realisms about which it has embarrassed itself since the days of the Miletian maid. Philosophical thinking peddles its wares today at a fear of self-sublations and falls head over heels in its eagerness to find favour with ironic, pragmatic and strategic realisms. The risk of such realistic metamorphoses is obvious. It can easily end up by substituting the bad with something worse. It is a short step from the cynical sublation of philosophy to the cynical self-denial of what great philosophy had embodied in its best aspects. Life caught between myth and everyday reality was once confronted by philosophy as that which, through its understanding of the good life, its social forms and its moral cosmic premises, was unambiguously cleverer. It lost its prestige to the extent that it lost its evident advantage and cleverness to normal life. In the transition from archaic teachings of wisdom to philosophy based on argument, it itself was engulfed in the twilight of alienation from life. It had to accept that the independent cleverness theories of pragmatics economics, strategy and politics proved themselves to be its better, until, with its logical niceties, it became infantile and academic, and stood there as the utopian idiot with its reminiscences about great ideals. Today philosophy is surrounded on all sides by maliciously clever empiricisms and realistic disciplines that know better. If these latter really did know what is better, Perhaps not much would be lost with the downfall of philosophy. Since, however, today's scientific disciplines and doctrines of cleverness, without exception, can be suspected of providing knowledge that aggravates our situation rather than improves it, our interest turns back to what has not received its due by any previous sublation of philosophy. In a world full of injustice, exploitation, war, resentment, isolation and blind suffering, the sublation of philosophy by the cleverer strategies of such a life brings forth also a painful lack of philosophy. And this is documented by, among other things, the neoconservative hunger for meaning today. The quote-unquote false life that 
already gloried in overcoming philosophy and metaphysics, had never understood the contradiction of philosophy to such a life. Philosophy demands of life what Thales has described as, quote, what is difficult, end quote. To know thyself. At this point, the ironies are reversed. Great philosophy has always taken life more seriously than the seriousness of life has taken philosophy. The latter's basic attitude towards life has always been a deeply respectful overtaxing. It reminded life of undreamed of capacities for self ascent into the universal. The firmly established distance between great and small spirits, which has existed since the age of the turning point of the high cultures, about 500 BC, became the stimulus of philosophical, anthropological systems of exercise and theories of development. The classical, know thyself, contained the presumptuous demand of a previously unknown disciplinary self-limitation of individuals in connection with an equally unparalleled heightening of their cosmic self-understanding. From this height, everyday consciousness, with its acquired practical tricks, its short-winded conventionality, and its helplessness in the face of the emotions, appeared as an unrespectable, immature, preliminary form of developed reason. From then on, philosophy struggled with everyday consciousness with the aim of getting the better of its partly dull, partly cunning refusal to grow up in a philosophical sense. That is, of consciously shifting into the quote-unquote meaningful holes. Reader's note, holes means here, uh, like the complete versions of something, not holes as in like a hole in the ground. Meaningful holes. Therefore, classical philosophy, centred on know thyself, is essentially exercise and pedagogy. The commandment of self-knowledge aimed at a self-assimilation of reflecting individuals into well-ordered social and natural holes, with the unexpressed promise that the human being, with the unexpressed promise that the human being even when the state of social affairs is an affront to every thought of a rational order, may know itself to be bound into a deeper, natural, cosmic happening of reason. With Know Thyself, classical philosophy promised the individual that, on the way inward, he or she would discover a common denominator for world and self. In this way, it secured for itself an unexcelable binding force that reliably bound existence together with reflection. That is why for Thales, knowledge of the heavens and self-investigation could proceed directly parallel to each other. For as long as philosophy was able to believe in a synchronizing of experiences of the world and of the self, the principle of know thyself could be spun out to an encyclopedia of knowledge. Just as the encyclopedia could be compressed into know thyself, The classical systems drew their pathos from the certainty that worldly and self-experience had to converge under the sign of the absolute. They could still proceed from the premise that reflection and life, theoretical and practical reason, could never completely separate themselves from each other because all knowing found an ultimate regulative in the self-knowledge of the knowers. In modernity, the brackets that in classical thinking held reflection and life together burst apart. It becomes increasingly clear to us that we are at the point of losing the common denominator of self-experience and world experience. Even the most honourable postulate of self-knowledge today is suspected of having been naive. And what once appeared as the summit of reflectedness is today confronted by the suspicion that it was possibly only a chimera that arose through the misuse of metaphors of reflection. The greater part of present day object knowledges has in fact freed itself from any relation to itself and confronts our consciousness in that extracted matter of factness from which no path is any longer bent back to a subjectivity. Nowhere does an ego experience its quote-unquote self 
in modern scientific knowledge. Where this ego still bends over itself with its obvious tendency to a worldless inwardness it leaves reality behind. Thus, for present day thinking, inwardness and outwardness, subjectivity and things have been split into alien worlds. At the same time, the classical premise of philosophizing falls away. Know thyself has long since been understood by modern people as an invitation to an ego trip for an escapist ignorance. Modern reflection expressly renounces any competency in embedding subjectivities without rupture into objective worlds. What it uncovers is rather the gulf between both. The self knows itself to be connected in a mysterious way to a world without being able to recognize itself in it in the sense of Greek cosmology. And no meditating authorities, such as social psychology, uh, excuse me, no mediating authorities, such as social psychology or neurophysiology, can alter anything in this regard. Modern self-reflection, in spite of all of its turning, turnings back, thus can no longer arrive home. The subjects do not know themselves as at home with themselves, either in themselves or in their environments. For radical thinking and modernity, at the self pole, emptiness exposes itself, and at the world pole, estrangement. How an emptiness is supposed to recognize itself in a stranger cannot be imagined by our reason no matter how hard we try. Here, a, so to speak, non-Euclidean reflectiveness is astir that can no longer circle about the selfness of the self. If the movements of reflection in classical philosophy could be depicted in the structure of Homer's Odysseus, in which a wandering hero returns home via a thousand false paths across the whole world in order to be recognized by his woman, that is, by his soul, then the reflections of modern thinking in no way still find their way back home. They either move on the spot in essenceless flurries, drained of experience, or they drift on like the eternal Jew or the flying Dutchman, without hope of arriving through the perpetually alien. The Odysseus of today no longer finds his Ithaca. His Penelope has long forgotten him. And if even today she still unravels at night what was woven during the day, for fear of finishing, that does not hinder her from losing in the faces of her innumerable wifeless bows the face of the one whom might return. Even if Odysseus really found his way back to where he came from, no recognition could take place. And his own starting point would have to confront him as something as alien as the other tracts of land on his wanderings. For the modern subject, a quote-unquote vagabond in existence, there is no longer any return home to the identical. What appeared to us as our own and as origin, as soon as we turn around, has always been altered and been lost. In view of these developments, the claim of classical philosophy to be more serious than mere life does not look good. Since modern thinking no longer entrusts itself with the translation of self-knowledge into worldly knowledge, and of world experience into self-experience, philosophy has had to withdraw from theories of objective reason into those of subjective reason. The ground is thus taken from under the feet of the ancient holistic pathos, and philosophy sinks into the apparent truncatedness and groundlessness of the subjective. The truth is, however, that this subjective element establishes and unfolds itself in the process of modern civilization to such an extent that it was able to gain as much of a foothold as seemed necessary for its self-preservation. Quote unquote, subjectivity casts its nets over the object worlds and transformed excessively powerful first nature into a tamed second nature. 
Herein lies the source of modernity. The latter fosters the unfolding of the subjective to the relatively objective, of that which has no foothold to something that provides for itself its own foothold. The transformation of the world's wildness into what we make and think through. Modern philosophies that set themselves the task of grasping these transformations are those we rightly think of as the rational philosophies. Social philosophies, philosophies of science, philosophies of labour, of technology, of language. They link up directly with the producing, acting, thinking and speaking of a subjectivity that has become sure of itself. Therefore, a philosophy that does not speculate past the structures of the modern world is basically practical philosophy. As such, it must equate what is intelligible in the world with what is rationally feasible, thinkable, examinable and articulable. In the theory of subjective reason, the world is paraphrased as the content of our doings. Subjectivity has been turned fully into praxis. The glaring poverty of modern practical philosophy, which would really like to produce something sound, above all, a universally binding, rigorously grounded ethics, and cannot for the life of it manage to do so, however, nothing other than the poverty of subjective reason as such. Excuse me. The glaring poverty of modern practical philosophy, which would really like to produce something sound, above all, a universally binding, rigorously grounded ethics, and cannot for the life of it manage to do so, is, however, nothing other than the poverty of subjective reason as such. The latter finds its foothold in itself only to the extent that it uninterruptedly pursues its activistic fury of, quote-unquote, praxis. Modern reason knows itself to be tied to the back of the praxis tiger, as long as the latter runs its course in a predictable way, subjective reason remains in relative balance. But woe betide when it gets caught in one of its notorious crises and becomes frenzied due to resistances or profitable prey. Then it lets its praxis writer know that with ethical tranquilizers alone, a predatory animal of its dimensions cannot be brought under control. Practical philosophy that tries to be respectable thus develops against its will into a seminar for modern tiger management. There it is discussed whether it is possible to talk reasonably with the beast, or whether it would be better if a few of the tendentially dispensable riders were sacrificed to the stubborn systemic brute. In these taming conversations of subjective reason with the praxis tiger, cynicism is inevitably in play which, with the appeal to reason, let it sit be known with a wink that it did not mean it so seriously. The superficial view of things, in addition, confirms this stance, where thinking has to agonise, especially over the projects of praxis that were unleashed with its own aid and have become autonomous. Their subject of reason, even as reason, is treated with irony, and suspected of being merely subjectivity that keeps on tearing along. With incessant irony, modern philosophizing, which had once been so sure of itself, shrinks to a circus-like rationalism that, in its efforts to train the praxis tiger, proves itself to be embarrassingly helpless. If the philosophers themselves, in time, are also become somewhat addled in this occupation, then given, th given how things are, it's no wonder. In order to visualise the curiosity, philosophy, in the modern world, one has to recall an ancient episode when a Greek Diadochian prince, to reciprocate for the gift of two elephants from the Indian Maharaja, sent back two very sensible philosophers. In the twilight of late enlightenment, the insight gains shape that our praxis, which we always held to be the most legitimate child of reason, in fact represents the central myth of modernity. The demythologization of praxis that thereby falls due 
forces. Let me try that again. The demythologization of praxis that thereby falls due forces radical corrections in the self-understanding of practical philosophy. The latter must now become clear about the grave extent to which it had been taken in by the myth of activity, and how blindly it had given itself over to its alliance with rational activism and constructivism. In this blinding, practical reason could not see that the highest concept of behaviour is not doing, but letting things be. And that it achieves its utmost, not by reconstructing the structures of our doing, but by penetrating the relations between doing and desisting. Every act of deed is etched in the matrix of passivity. Every act of disposing over something remains dependent on the stable massiveness of what is not at our disposal. Every change is borne also by the reliable perseverance of what is unchanged. And everything that is calculated rests on the indispensable base of what is unpredictably spontaneous. At this point, the most modern reflection of the classical Know Thyself is recovered. It leads us in a quasi-neoclassical movement of thought to the point where we can see how the producing, reflecting, active self is inlaid in a passive self that cannot be manipulated by any deed. All subjectivities, competences, activisms and illusions of doers are still borne by this deeper layer. And no matter how much activity belongs to our essence, it nevertheless has basically the structure of letting oneself do. The insight that quote-unquote feasibility has structural limits has, since its processing by enlightenment, lost its anti-enlightenment tone and by no means necessarily ends up in the maliciously joyful impotence philosophies with which the conservatism of the church has long since pursued its business. Now it can be revealed that reason and praxis do not belong exclusively together, but that in a non-praxis, a refraining from acting, a letting happen, and a non-intervention, higher qualities of insight can come to expression than in any deed, no matter how well thought through. Our ancient main witness, Diogenes of Sinope, the illuminated beggar, the self-sufficient, ironic representative of the pathos of nature, is to be cited one last time. He who, with his quote-unquote restraint, had found a model for those ancient European virtues of forbearance, from which modernity, with its activist ethos of self-assertion, has turned away as radically as possible. Among the innumerable anecdotes documenting the impulse of his teaching, one in particular shines forth with profundity. Quoting Diogenes Laertius, volume 6, page 29, He praised those who want to marry and do not, those who want to sail off and do not those who want to be active in affairs of state and refrain from doing so, who want to educate children and do not, who prepare themselves to enter into the services of a prince and hold off. Here a puzzling oriental, indeed Asiatic component, comes into the world feeling of this man, which had made its way from the far off corner of the Black Sea to the western metropolis of Athens. It suggests that where we have not done anything, no tiger is on the prowl from which we would have difficulty dismounting. Those who can let things be are not pursued from behind by projects that have taken on a life of their own. Those who exercise the praxis of abstention do not get caught in the self-continuation automatism of unleashed activisms. In that Diogenes, as they say, placed nature against the law. He anticipated the principle of self-regulation and restricted active interventions to an extent, quote, in accord with nature, end quote. 
Imbued with the spontaneous flourishing of structures, he put his trust in intellecti and renounced projects. Although ancient kinicism, with its Socratic conviction that virtue is learnable, seems to stress the efforts of the subject, it nevertheless knew very well that only through forbearance and tranquillity would subjective reason be capable of hearing an object of reason within itself. The great thinking of antiquity is rooted in the experience of enthusiastic tranquillity, when, on the summit of having thought, the thinker steps aside and lets himself be permeated by the self-revelation of truth. Human openness for what we today, with both sympathy and nostalgia, call quote-unquote objective reason, for the ancients, this was based in quote cosmic passivity, end quote, and in the observation of how radical thinking can make up its unavoidable belatedness in relation to the pre-given world and, by virtue of its experience of being, reaches the same height as the whole. This culminates in the classical temerities of world reason, or the logos that, to use Heidegger's words, lets itself, quote, be given to think, end quote, what is thinkable by being itself. That modernity has had to take leave of theories of objective reason follows from the fundamentally altered relation to the world of modern thinking. Subjective reason feels it as unbearable audacity when the Logos doctrines demands that we relinquish our own interests and assimilate ourselves into a great whole, roughly in the same way that parts of a totality that benevolently took care of all would have to subordinate themselves to that totality. It is impossible to still think of subjectivity and its relation to the world according to the model of the part and the whole. Subjectivity understands itself unquestioningly as a quote-unquote world for itself. And if we today had, and if today we even had to lose the harmonistic idea of the individual as a microcosmic mirror of the macrocosmos, modern subjectivity would nevertheless be distinguished as a stubborn microchaos in a universal connection that is inaccessible to the concepts of reason. We have focused essentially on subjectivity because we could not believe in the sense and well-meaning of a whole, even if we wanted to. Said drastically, we have subjectivized ourselves as subjects because we have experienced the whole as disunion, nature as the source of horrid shortages, and the social world as world war. This is what has awakened a suspicious alertness in modern consciousness against importunate holistic doctrines with which the world's misery is supposed to be presented as harmony, and individual claims on life are supposed to be talked into self-sacrifice. The conventional theories of objective reason are comprised by the fact that they have been that they have seen <coughs> Excuse me. The conventional theories of objective reason are com compromised by the fact that they have been seen through as tricks in the service of orders of domination. Little by little, they are supposed to feed the internalization of sacrifices to the members of society for the sake of social wholes that, in the end, usually remain so relentlessly against the individuals that one would think that they had never made their sacrifices. It is no accident that the Enlightenment began with scepticism about the effectiveness of religious sacrifice and with the exposure of priestly sacrificial swindles. Once such a suspicion has become firm, it will scarcely still occur to individuals to sacrifice themselves or something of themselves. It was modern Enlightenment that taught us to turn back the process of the internalization of sacrifice step by step until our life appeared in lurid individualization, not sacrificed, but also unconnected with the impossible great whole, as aggregate of the pure will to live in the armaments of subjective reason, which no longer lets itself be taken in by anything and demands everything from existence. 
in its legitimate disassembly of the great world images of objective reason, enlightenment runs the danger of destroying not only the ideological pretenses of the fraud of sacrifice, but also the inheritance of a pacifistic consciousness without which practical reason cannot really be called reason. In its best moments, classical logocentric thinking also knew that its visions of objective world reason cannot be forced into a consistent campaign of thinking, but light up like moments of happiness when the possible has been done, and the greater connection becomes visible between deed and forbearance. Where, therefore, the thought of totalities pervaded by reason seriously emerges, thinkers show that being Thinkers show that, beyond their active efforts, they know the passive reason of an integrating, letting be. Accordingly, the idea that the whole world is a symphonic process, which can also be read as the cipher for the subjective capacity for the utmost relaxation in a relation to the world that is no longer coloured by animosity. Those who can, quote-unquote, let themselves go in a cosmic structure, as if at home, aim not at their self-mutilation in favour of a Moloch totality, but at a creative flowing into what is possible, and an unaffected self-preservation and self-elevation of existence. Such an aim obviously corresponds to the interests of even the most subjective reason. Here, what I want to call not the dialectic, but the irony of enlightenment sets in. With its activistic storming of doing, planning, and thinking for oneself, it was so successful for two centuries that in the meantime it can scarcely still bear its own success. Ironically, where modern subjective reason becomes enmeshed in the gears of subjective interests, reason succumbs. Whereas where subjective reason affects something in accord with reason, subjectivities have faded into the background. Empirical subjectivity is at least just as far removed from subjective reason as the latter is from an objective reason. Each, viewed from the standpoint of mere life, is just as much idealistically exaggerated. In social reality, subjective reason is taken in by private reason, and thereby pulled down from its beautiful universality to the ground of a thousand chaotically juxtaposed individual strategies. Today it can be seen that the modern constructions of a subjective reason were no less utopian than the visions of an objective reason were in antiquity in the Middle Ages. For subject of reason, there is nothing without a coherent universal subject. Accordingly, in modern thinking, the same spook of a quote-unquote total subject wanders, which is supposed to bear the entire rational potential of reason within itself. And thus, the universalism of enlightenment soars as high as any thinking that aims at the whole ever could. It lives from the idea of a communicative total mediation in which all privacies would be melted into a planetary conversation. Without its communicative, pathetic core, subject of reason could have nothing to counterpose to its reduction to the format of private reason in the service of individual, group and systemic egoisms. Only with the anticipation of universal understanding can enlightenment refrain from the war of individual strategies and save itself in the universal. Since, having dissolved social communication under the sign of myth, enlightenment must rely on the myth of communication. In communication, the struggling individual strategies would be so softened and relaxed that they could flow into rational agreements. In this way, a structure arises similar to what was observed in the relation between the individual and the objective reason. Only through the individual's becoming consciously passive and tranquil does the universe prevail against the particular, the objective against the subjective, experience against mere imagination. 
Only they can expect something rational from communication, who have already conceded, in classical passivity and deep yieldingness, to the universal, a precedence to the process of reaching agreement over the motives of its participants. Otherwise, no matter how much mutual understanding was overtaken, it would only become manifest that we cannot reach agreement with each other. If the inability to subjugate oneself is a characteristic structure of modern subjective autonomy, subjective reason must at least be allowed to demand that the subjugate, subjects subjugate themselves to the priority of communication over those communicating, and of experiences over quote-unquote needs. Otherwise it would lose its credentials as reason. The critique of cynical reason has shown how subjects who have become both hard and agile in existential and social structures of struggle, have given the universal the cold shoulder, and have not hesitated to repudiate all high cultural ideals when it was a matter of self-preservation. Quote-unquote, pugnacious reason is from the start an activist and untranquil reason that at no price lets itself be made fluid and never subjects itself to the precedence of what is common universal and encompassing. Under these conditions, the efforts of practical philosophy are confined within depressingly narrow limits. Practical reason, which attempts to guide the undertakings of subjectivities, runs as if in vain up against the unpliable self-insistence of millions of fragmented centres of private reason. The latter want to subject every rationality to private conditions, and act as if enlightenment has no right to intrude into certain reserved places where secret strategies are spun. Subject of reason that has regressed to private reason always bears within itself a will tonight, quoting Ernst Weiss. A cunning not wanting to know about connections, a making itself inaccessible to the demands of universality, and a strategic hardening made clever by life against all sirens' melodies of communication and reconciliation. Indeed, quote-unquote, respectable individual strategies may occasionally, quote-unquote, negotiate. But where the inner strategists look over the shoulders of the dialogue partners, there the, quote-unquote, communication is also strategically perverted. Productive communication already eludes calculable feasibility, and where it succeeds has the structure of letting oneself communicate. The cynicism analysis, by contrast, describes the interactions of subjectivism that cannot unwind, of highly armed centres of private reason, conglomerations of power bristling with weapons and science-supported systems of hyperproduction. None of them would even dream of bending to a communicative reason. Rather, under the pretense of communication, they want to subjugate the latter to its private conditions. Under the pressure of suffering in the most recent crises, members of our civilizations see themselves forced, quasi-neoclassically, to repeat the know thyself. And in this they discover their systematic inability to communicate in the way that would guarantee true de-escalation. The subjective that cannot mirror itself in any whole, nevertheless encounters itself in countless analogous subjectivities that, similarly wordless and encapsulated, pursue only their own goals, and that, where they interact with others, are only bound to each other, precariously and subject to revocation, in antagonistic cooperation. The renewed know thyself produces an image of incurable self-preservation that is mercilessly thrown back into every self by all others. Hence, if in modernity worldly and self-experience converge in spite of all sundering, they do so under the condition that the struggles of self-preservation, of privatised subject of reason, inwardly as well as outwardly, psychologically as well as technologically, in the intimate domain as well as in political spheres, have generated the same isolation of subjects, the same iciness, the same polemical strategic subjectivisms, 
and the same quick-footed denial of high cultural ethical ideals. I have tried to develop a language in which one can speak about both spheres with the same expressions. In the analysis of cynicism, the language of self-experience is again directly synchronized with the language of worldly experience, assuming we wanted to make the self side speak in an extremely honest way, the world side in a ruthlessly clear way. So much is obvious that the cynicism analysis aims at a critique of subjective reason without immediately wanting to return to the lost illusions of an objective reason. This would mean fighting against one false respectability with another. The critique cynical reason therefore argues imminently and dialectically. In overview of the course of enlightenment, it recapitulates the inner contradictions in enlightenment and repeats the ironic, quote unquote, labor on the superego, or better the combative, quote unquote, labor on the ideal that inevitably falls due under the predominance of strategic subjectivities in class and military societies. In this we have dealt with the cultural struggle for the great ideals, whose validity or worthlessness decides the existence of decay of personal and collective integrity. Heroic courage, the legitimacy of power, love, the medical arts, praise of the living, truth, authenticity, obedience to experience, just exchange. In this order we have sketched phenomenologically the various worlds of values with their inner ruptures and struggles. One must have once taken these ideals seriously, without reservation, in order to be able to empathise with the drama of their satirical accusation by chemical resistance, and with the tragicomedy of their self-denial by the serious cynicism of the will to power and profit. Those who have never respected such ideals and orient themselves, in their own twilight, toward their ambiguity, will never understand the necessity of the questions posed here. Where these ambiguities come from and which experiences had to dull the once uncomplicated shining light of enlightenment to the over-problematic twilight of late modernity. Thus the critique of subjective reason, as well as that of strategic reason, of strategic as well as cynical reason, leads through a manifold, convoluted odyssey of ambivalences, whose threads, the closer we come to the present, entangle themselves all the more in threatening complexity. Quote, Sapere aude, have the courage to use your own understanding, is thus the motto of enlightenment, end quote. In this way, Immanuel Kant had formulated the slogan of the still self-certain, modern, subjective doctrine of reason in his famous essay of 1784, What is Enlightenment? With sceptical optimism, this reason thought itself capable, through subjective efforts, of coping with the tendencies of the world that did not yet obey the standards of reason. One's own ability to know, summoned by Kant, is based on the vital quality of a courage that is alien to the modern despair about the quote-unquote state of affairs. Although Kant forbade us to think of objective goals in nature, his philosophizing orients itself, to be sure, not toward an overarching world reason, but toward the confidence in our ability to bring reason into the state of the world. Secretly, classical enlightenment too assumes that the nature of things as if it were already prepared to bend to our aims, has already come to the greatest part of the way towards the efforts of subjective reason. By connecting the use of the understanding directly to courageous self-confidence, Kant betrays that, although reason is supposed to be restricted critically and discreetly to achievements of subjectivity, he relies in his extra-critical relation to the world on a great mute accommodation of nature to reason. It is courage that allows enlightenment thinking to imagine a rational guidance of the state of the world. This courage hints at that forbearance in which the activity of enlightenment too must know itself to be structurally embedded. 
wherever enlightenment shows a promise or sort of success, it has the structure of a courageous, spontaneous, letting oneself think and do that relies on the possibility that our knowing and activity do not blindly and subjectively race past all tendencies of reality, but creatively and adeptly join up with strivings and forces of the world in order in the end to make something more out of it in the sense of rational goals. In view of past and threatening world catastrophes, today's historically frustrated life feeling may no longer really believe in this. Often it shows itself to be extremely uncourageous in quote-unquote making use of its own understanding. Since they have to a large extent lost their courage to reason, the heirs of enlightenment today, nervous, doubting and forcibly without illusions, are on their way to a global cynicism. Only in the form of derision and renunciation do references to the ideals of humane culture still seem bearable. Cynicism as enlightened false consciousness has become a hard-boiled, shadowy cleverness that has split courage off from itself, holds anything positive to be fraud, and is intent only on somehow getting through life. He who laughs last laughs as if in plural shock. Cynical consciousness adds up the bad experiences of all times and lets only the prospectless uniformity of hard facts prevail. Modern cynicism is the knot in which, quoting Kant's On Eternal Peace, quote, snake-like writhings of an immoral doctrine of cleverness, end quote, entangle themselves. In the neo-cynical attitude, world historical learning processes of bitterness come to fruition. They have stamped the traces of the coldness of exchange, of world wars, and the self-denial of ideals in our consciousnesses, which have become sick with experience. Hey, we're alive. Hey, we're selling ourselves. Hey, we're arming. Those who die young save social security contributions. In this way, cynicism guarantees the expanded reproduction of the past on the newest level of what is currently the worst. It is for this reason that prophecies of an imminent and man-made end of the world are so much in vogue. Quote, have the courage to use your own bomb, end quote. As if in a fever, cynically unfettered realism even speaks the truth to us with warnings. With macabre fits of fear, the panicking subjectivisms rustle through the media and speak of the apocalypse. Quote, look out, look out, the times are peculiar, and peculiar children they have. Us. End quote. Have we not become as Descartes conceived us? The res cognitans in self-guiding missiles? The isolated thing for yourself in the middle of similar beings. We are the metal ego, the block ego, the plutonium ego, the neutron ego. We are the fallout shelter citizens, the artillery subjects, the missile pensioners, the cannon shareholders, the security lemures, the armoured pensioners, the apocalyptic riders of the compulsion of things, and the phantom pacifists who promote the better cause with nuclear free style ethics. Only the greatest impudence still has words for reality. Only anarchic waywardness still finds an expression for contemporary normality. As in the days of Diogenes, the bearers of the system have lost their self-confidence to the apparently crazy ones. They now can only choose between the false self-experience and collective suicide, and the suicide of false subjectivity and real self-experience. Sapere aude, 
remains the motto of an enlightenment that, even in the twilight of the most recent dangers, resists intimidation by catastrophe. Only out of its courage can a future still unfold that would be more than the expanded reproduction of the worst of the past. Such courage nourishes itself from the now faint currents of recollection of a spontaneous ability of life to be in order, an order not constructed by anybody. Where the old doctrines tried to speak of quote-unquote objective reason, they also wanted, with ther therapeutic intent, to remind us that in a world that has become thoroughly alienated since the beginning of the era of high culture, things can perhaps again flow and order themselves if we disarm as subjects and step back from respectably camouflaged destructive activism into letting things be. Can one really still say such a thing? Is the alliance of our rationality with quote-unquote realism and cynicism secretly already so consolidated that it no longer wants to know anything about any reason other than activistic reason? With this question, our critical investigation comes to an end. What is left to say? Experiences would now come into play that one can only refer to mysteriously without being able to call on the aid of proofs. That about which one cannot argue should be told at a more opportune time. It is a matter of experiences for which I can find no other word than the exuberant experience of a well-spent life. In our present moments, when overcome with success, even the most energetic activity gives way to passivity, and the rhythmics of the living carry us spontaneously. Courage can suddenly make itself felt as a euphoric clarity or a seriousness that is wonderfully tranquil within itself. It awakens the present within us. In the present, awareness climbs all at once to the heights of being. Cool and bright, every moment enters its space. You are no different from its brightness, its coolness, its jubilation. Bad experiences give way to new opportunities. No history makes you old. The unkindnesses of yesterday compel you to nothing. In the light of such a presence of spirit, the spell of reenactments is broken. Every conscious second eradicates what is hopelessly past and becomes the first second of an other history. <laughs>